Hello. <laughs> My name is Robert W. Saunders. I'm a native Pampas. And uh, <laughs> in 1951, uh, on Christmas night, over in a little town called Mims, in the where my wife lived. I lived in a little town called the suburb of Titusville. Uh, a man named Harry T. Moore, Harry Tyson Moore, he was serving as the executive secretary of the NACP in Florida, he was killed by a Klansman who had placed a bomb in his house. It was on Christmas night. He and his wife were killed. In the state of Florida, the crime has never been solved. Uh, at that time, Governor Phil Warren was the governor, and he got into a squabble with a man named Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP. He said that uh, Governor Phil Warren claimed that uh, those laborologists from Harlem were coming down here trying to stir up trouble with the good black citizens of Florida. He didn't call them black citizens, he called them colored citizens. And that uh, uh, if they would leave the state alone, everything would be all right. I happened to have been in Detroit and uh, was attending the Detroit Un University of Detroit Law School at the time. And uh, I had met Harry T. Moore just in 1946 after I came out of the Army. Uh, I had been doing some work with Florida Sutton on Sweet Life Andrews. And uh, Mr. Moore walked in, and uh, to look at him, he was an unassuming little guy. Uh, but if the history and when the history is written, and it is now being written, you will find that Harry T. Moore was really the leader in efforts to bring about equality in the state of Florida. And he had a whole lot of ideas which uh, have now become part of the uh, civil rights program. Uh, Moore was the forefront uh, and fighter in bringing about the right for black people to vote in the Democratic primary in Florida. Uh, at that time, black teachers, and Stetson knows about this, black teachers in Florida received anywhere from $50 to $150 less than their counterparts. Even though they may have had the same degrees, the same experience, the only thing that they didn't have that uh, perhaps was uh, equivalent to their white counterparts in the teaching uh, educational system in Florida was that black teachers could not attend any white institution in Florida. They had to attend what was then Florida a and College. And anything that was not taught at Florida a and College, but was taught at the University of Florida, uh, they couldn't go to the University of Florida. They had to go to another school, Northern School. The irony of it all was that the state would pay their tuition they're traveling everything to go to Columbia University or wherever they wanted to go. Now, Harry T. led the fight to equalize teachers' salaries along with a man named Edward Davis. Uh, I could go on naming others that uh, joined in that fight. But the history is such that uh, those persons who were the pioneers in the efforts to bring about equal education and do away with discrimination in education, particularly the teachers. Uh, in order to pull their programs together, they had to go from, they would meet in Palatka this week, and they'd go to Titusville the next weekend, they'd probably travel over to Pinellas County, and the reason why they had to do that was because of the threats that they were faced with. When I was assigned to Florida, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Roy Wilkins, uh, Walter White, rather, was the executive secretary of the NACP. 
And uh, Walter, after I'd been interviewed by the director of branches, Glock Current, with NACC, and about a week later, I was sent a telegram to come to New York to be interviewed by Walter White. So I knew that I had been joking with uh, Glasgow when he was in Detroit, and I said, are you all hiring anybody in NACP? And we laughed. And then a couple of days later, Walter <laughs> came back and said, are you kidding? Do you really want to work with NACP? I said, yes. Well, I went to New York and sitting in the interview with a man named Edward Davis, who later became, he was at one time the principal of the Lomax School here in Tampa. But because of his participation in the effort to equalize teach the salaries of black teachers in Florida, <coughs> Uh, a meeting was held at St. Paul AME Church with Thurgood Marshall. And the next morning, the school superintendent knew about that meeting <coughs> and called for, Thur for Ed Davis to come down to the school headquarters. Ed was demoted and given a little school somewhere out in the Boondocks in Lewisburg County. But he left and went to Ocala. And when he came back, he came back as the president of the Central Life Insurance Company in, in Tampa. Uh, Ed was there, and then there was a lawyer named Paul Perkins. Paul Perkins, incidentally, was the nephew of Daniel Perkins, the former husband of Blanche Beatty, Armour. And uh, Paul had been actively working in a case called the Roblin case. I won't go into great detail because Jesse might mention that. <laughs> But uh, the interview uh, was interesting. Seated, sitting there with Walter White, who had just been appointed to a commission by the President of the United States dealing with human rights and whatnot. <coughs> Walter White was a the leader in the field of human rights and civil rights. Uh, I'm a young fellow, and you know, this is an opportunity that comes to once in a lifetime. Well, the interview ended, and then I went back to Detroit, and a week later I got a telegram saying, come and be prepared to stay. When I got back to New York, I had to spend two or three weeks orientation. At that time also, about a week or a month, a couple of months, weeks later, they hired Mecca Evans. So Mecca and I came on board the staff at the same time. I'm a survivor. Mentor was killed. Uh, the orientation uh, carried us into the legal office of the NACP, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, we met people like Constance Baker, Martin, who was the lawyer in the uh, Manning's case here in Tampa, and who's now a federal judge. Uh, we met well, the whole staff. We met uh, Roy Wilkins, and I knew Roy Wilkins and I were frat brothers. And I was trying to figure out how was I going to talk to Roy, because Roy was really the brains behind much of the NACP work. And the first thing I did when I had to go in and talk to Roy was to ask him, was he financial in the fraternity? And Roy laughed, and I laughed, and we hit it off. Uh, but the result of it was that after orientation, Walter White called me in. He said, we're sending you to Florida. And he told me about Governor Phil Warren saying that the rebel rousers in Harlem were coming down to Florida trying to stir up trouble. <laughs> and they were demanding an investigation of the killing of Harry T. Moore. And nothing was being done by the state to solve the problem. And uh, he said, the reason why we're sending you is because you're a Floridian and we want him to know that we don't have to send anybody down from Harlem. We can send him to Florida <laughs> to work. <laughs> That's how I got down back home. <laughs> uh, I learned something that perhaps nobody knows, and that is that Hillsborough County was to have been the fifth county and what eventually became the Brown case, 1954 Supreme Court decision. 
And this is what Fergus was kind of upset about, was because they had a very good case. Uh, they had been a case filed by uh, J.P. Harvard Sr., the father of Senator Harvard, who is now in the legislature, in 1947 or 48. And uh, before the case could be solved, or the judge could rule, uh, black leaders in Florida had sat down and compromised. And Berger was really upset and angry, and Hughes Black County was dropped out of that historical, uh, what he eventually became a historical case, because of compromise and accepting Blake High School. Uh, Berger told me also that when you get to Florida, look up Stetson Kennedy. I didn't know he was crazy like me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Stetson had been working with civil rights people, and he had been writing articles for the Pittsburgh Courier, and had been doing investigations for the Pittsburgh Courier. And uh, that's how I got to know him, and uh, we got to be quite friendly, particularly when I was working in the federal government. And people who wanted to get Stetson in Jacksonville, Stetson was working in the poverty program in Jacksonville. And they still tried to retaliate against Stetson in the Jacksonville was a Klan country out there, you may not know it. <laughs> uh, uh, they tried to retaliate against Stetson, and we had to go in there, and uh, we had to kick some pants up there to make them realize that uh, they couldn't retaliate against the man because of his past history and what he had done. But Stetson is a person, and when history is written about civil rights, you will find that even though many black leaders were involved in trying to bring about equality and justice, but there were white people too who were involved. The NACP was formed by a group of white and black people. The merger with the what was known as Niagara Movement in 1911 uh, brought about the uh, consolidation of black leaders and white leaders uh, to deal with social justice in this country, particularly after the race riot that occurred in the hometown of Abraham Lincoln in Illinois. Uh, even in Florida, uh, I sometimes talk with some of the graduates from the University of Florida, and they don't even know how the school got desegregated. Uh, they don't know that in 1948 that a suit was filed to desegregate the University of Florida. And immediately, it was just a term, and the Florida Supreme Court uh, took over the case and decided that they weren't going to integrate that school. And it was about 12 years later before the school was finally opened up, and only after uh, they came in and they went to uh, Virgil Hawkins and they told Virgil that uh, there had been a recommendation from, I think it was the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals or maybe a Supreme Court Justice, that forget the original case from the University of Florida and filed a new suit in the federal court in Tallahassee. I recall sitting in the court when Justice Joseph Devane, who had been sitting on the case even after we filed it anew, and had been ordered by the Fifth Circuit of Court in New Orleans to hear the University of Florida case and to rule on it. And uh, Judge Devane said that if he had his way, that black students going into the University of Florida, and he had to open it up because the half courts had told him to do it. But if he had his way, any black student going into the University of Florida would have to post a bond in order to keep down the damage that would have been done as a result of their going in. This was amazing coming from a federal judge, but this is what was happening in Florida. Uh, and I mentioned that many students don't know the fight that went on, particularly black students, to get them into higher education and into positions where they could 
apply and work. Uh, right now, those of us who came out of, well, I'm still in the civil rights movement. Uh, I still advise and counsel and work with the state conference and the national. But we see us going backwards now. Uh, the fight in California with Proposition 209. You haven't heard the last of that. Uh, when we talk about affirmative action, uh, one of my responsibilities when I was at the federal government was to implement the 1964 Civil Rights Act in the Southeast region. And we never talked about quotas. When I came to work as the Director of Equal Opportunity for Hillsborough County Government, there was no affirmative action plan even though they had told us in Atlanta that they had one. But I knew they didn't have one because I was sitting there as the civil rights chief of the Southeast region for OEO. And they had never submitted a plan to us as even though we had <coughs> asked for it. And that's another story that we're going to have to chat about <coughs> because I can tell you a whole lot about Hillsborough County. I can tell you about the problems we had in bringing about an affirmative action program in Hillsborough County. I'm going to write about that because it needs to be told. It needs to be told how the constitutional officers resisted uh, the Board of County Commissioners who give them the budget, approve their budget, and pay the money for these constitutional officers to run their offices. Uh, they resisted having to give civil rights reports to the Board of County Commissioners, even though the Board of County Commissioners is the constitutional body that has a responsibility for civil rights. But the point I'm making is that there were white people, and uh, at the University of South and the University of Florida, and Stetson will be interested in this, when the first 10 black students went into the University of Florida, there were white students who paid the bulk of the money for them to get in, the Americans for Democratic Action, and then the NACP had to raise the rest of the money. But when you talk with black students now, they don't know. And they think it just came about through the goodness of somebody. <laughs> now, Stetson can tell you, nobody gives you anything. Everything that black people have won and gotten, they have to demand it, they have to fight for it. People have died for it. Harry T. Moore died. He was life. Fortunately, I was telling this that now in Brevard County, uh, the whole of Harry T. Moore has been purchased by the Brevard County County Commission and they're going to make it a state park. And they have put up a new courthouse building which is named after Harry and Harry T. Moore. This is something because it is, it shows that uh, with the help of our friends, white and black, we can accomplish. Of course, Stephen Kennedy is one guy that all the stuff is made out of. <laughs>
and put him in this phone booth with my <laughs> glass that he could see out and hear. But this is you know, contamination that the total loss is. But that, that's how desegregation came to the University of Florida, to a phone booth. Uh, I, uh, in this matter of getting into the Klan, I trust it's understood I was never a Klansman at heart. Uh, I was uh, in there for the purpose of breaking it up to the best of my ability. Uh, from, from the beginning. So it's not a question of any transformations all over. So my, I had a grandfather who fought in the, fought the Confederacy. And I had an uncle who was a great titan of the Florida, Northeast Florida clan. But uh, I was never uh, at all so inclined. Uh, on the contrary, uh, uh, I'm talking to you now about World War II. And the fact that uh, all of my classmates, most of them, had gone off to Europe and other parts of the world to fight against uh, Nazism and fascism, which of course are very much a form of, of racism, as witnessed the Holocaust and many other things. So uh, I, uh, when the sergeant uh, asked me to bend over and touch my toes, I could not get below my knees. And I had a back injury falling off of the fence as a, a young boy. I guess no good as a fence trapper, uh, even, even back then. <laughs> <laughs> I fell on, on the pavement and uh, could only touch my knees. So I, I was not over there fighting racism uh, overseas. So it occurred to me that the least I could do was to see what I could do about it over here. The Klan was very much in evidence when the war got underway especially here in Florida. And uh, so it struck me that my classmates were being shot at in a very big way, you know. But if I were to infiltrate the Klan, I might very well be shot at too, but at least it was problematical, like it was some room for maneuvering. But, uh, so it seemed like the least I could do. And I asked myself uh, further the question, and, you know, if I, if I don't do it, who will? And I didn't hear any. Anybody say anything? So that was good. And so I ended up in in Atlanta, which was the imperial city, uh, the imperial palace of the clans. The Invisible Empire was located in Atlanta. And uh, it occurred to me that perhaps the best way to get a foot in the clan door would be to go see uh, Dean Talmadge, who had been governor of Georgia on numerous occasions and uh, extremely racist and and pro plan. So I got Dean on the phone, and by this time I had established another identity. I found a job uh, ostensibly selling encyclopedias, which would enable me to travel around. And I took the name of my clan uncle, Perkins, and called myself John Perkins and got the false ID. And with all of that in hand, I called uh, Dean Talmadge, and he said, you have to come, come on by after dinner. Was, since this was Atlanta, I knew by dinner, he meant lunch. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I went on over after that and said, it's lunch. And uh, we got to talk about things like, at that time, one of the very big issues was the question of uh, the white primary, the Democratic Party uh, allowed no black membership and no black voting. And of course, throughout the South, this was the election. Uh, once you had the Democratic nomination in those days, uh, you were in. So this was total effective disfranchisement of the black southerners. And this thing was coming to a head. And uh, uh, among other things, I even said, what, what's going to happen about this uh, blacks wanting to vote? And he didn't say anything, but he tore off a scrap of paper and wrote something on it and handed it to me. And I looked at it, and what he had written was the word pistol. And this was his answer to the question of the, you know, the threat that he saw in a black voting. And anyway, uh, having established this relationship with John Perkins with Dean Talley, I proceeded to hang out in the hip joints there in Atlanta where I thought uh, I could see the plan, physiognomy, and so on. 
And sure enough, uh, in short order, I was approached by a clan clique uh, recruiter. And uh, he asked me, uh, I think it was three questions. He said, do you hate Negroes? Of course, he didn't use that word. And do you hate Jews? And have you got $10? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I gave the right answer to all three questions. And pretty soon, uh, he, well, he asked further questions like, just how bloodthirsty are you? And I said, I was bloodthirsty as hell. <laughs> but after that, I went home and looked in the mirror, you know, and practiced. And said, well, I said that convincingly enough, and I better, better practice up on this business before I get in any deeper. And uh, it wasn't easy for me. But in due course, uh, uh, I was invited to join the clan. Um, I recall above all the, the, the clan oath of secrecy. As you say, that if I ever divulge the secrets of the clan, I will willingly accept death, death, death at the hands of a brother. And this, this, <laughs> this made some impression on me, you know, and I took it. And along with it, they have upon uh, entering and leaving the clan tavern meeting hall, they have a sign of secrecy where they lower, seal their lips as they exit the clan hall, which signifies that they would not divulge anything about what happened inside that, that tavern. And the sequel to the sealing of the lips is the sign of off, off with the head, mm -hmm. make a chopping motion at the back of your neck to signify that you realize you lose your head if you, you don't keep your peace. So, uh, one of the things that struck me above all when I first looked around the tavern was the number of, of police blue khaki uh, blue, blue uniforms and the khaki uniforms, trousers of the sheriff's deputies sticking out beneath the clan robes. And there must have been at least uh, one third of the membership, you know, police law, law one and clan, clan one and the same. Police cars parked all up in the parking lot. I recall on one occasion the Grand Dragon, uh, somebody brought up something about some black he said acting up or doing something, you know, about all they have to say without defining their terms. And the Grand Dragon points to one of the police cops and, and says, I want you to take off your robe, get in your police car, and go out and take care of this right now, and come back and report to me. So I tell you that to give you some idea of the, the integral relationship between the clansmen and the lawmen. I mean, it was the public police officer paid by public being given his order by the Grand Dragon of the Kukuk Clan and told to report back to the clavier, not the police headquarters, but to him. Uh, there was another uh, clan uh, cop uh, in the clavier number one. This was the headquarters clan for the entire nation. And his name was, uh, they called him Itchy Trigger Finger Nash. <laughs> I recall they had a special ceremony one time to gave him some little prize or certificate for killing his, I think, 13th African-American in line of duty, unquote. So the Klan was giving recognition for this kind of uh, police uh, murder and being carried out in uniform under the book of law. The, uh, another occasion, the, uh, well, let me tell you, first that the moment I got in inside the clan, I went to the FBI in Atlanta and said I'm, I'm in the clan, uh, I'm in a position to give you uh, inside reports on the headquarters for meetings there every week. And they showed not the flights but took no notes, didn't want to know how to reach me, didn't ask me any questions, it's not, not interesting. And in subsequent years uh, I most I could get out of the FBI of those days, and the FBI was itself really white. Uh, there were no brown-skinned people, much less black, inside the agents of the FBI. Uh, they would take me down the hall and say, well, what do you know about Martin, the, the, the black activist or the real threat to this country? And what do you know about uh, Martin Luther King or Ralph Brown or whatever? 
So that's that was my relationship farther down the line in the later years. But on this occasion, you know, when I first uh, approached them, they said, in effect, not interested. I get back to the plan the following week, and the Grand Dragon says, well, I had a phone call last week from the FBI that warning me that the plan had been infiltrated and warning me to watch my step. I said, you can't ask about cooperation in this. I had to agree with him. You know, he went on to say from time to time that very often the FBI would call upon him to uh, carry out little jobs for them that uh, the FBI couldn't do in its own name, but uh, call on the plan to do it for them. And then just recently here in Hillsborough County, I talked to another uh, former uh, plan exposure, and he was on the payroll of the FBI. And he was telling me about how here in your territory there was a task of the green between uh, federal, uh, county, and municipal authorities for the plan to go out and beat up uh, gays at some locker room or something on the beach. And that uh, all of law enforcement would turn off its 911 number for 30 minutes or something, disconnect it on budget or do something. Uh, to give the Klan time to, to do what it was going to do, which they, they beat them up and threw them in the lake or whatever it was. So this is, I'm talking about recent times, with this kind of uh, chain of command to carrying out, you know, sort of jobs, lawmen and Klan. So back in the Clavern, uh, on another occasion, uh, it comes up that Brother Ben Culpepper is uh, the night watchman at a federal arsenal on the outskirts of, the, of Atlanta. So the Grand Dragon says, well, Brother Culpepper, what prevent us from coming out there and roping you up a little bit and stealing some of those machine guns for the race war that we know is coming? And Brother Ben says, well, then uh, just don't rope me up too much. Or anything they can't prove is dark by me. So back I went to the FBI and told them about this plan. And uh, uh, again, uh, no visible And the sequel <coughs> to that uh, approach to the FBI was that uh, some weeks later I inquired about uh, what had happened and was told, well, I, was, uh, I thought maybe he was arrested or fired at least. So, oh no, he, he was promoted. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's what happened with Brother Ben. Um, Yeah, I'd hope to be able to show you my black plant robe. It's going to be in the collection next door. And I think it's there now, but we couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we couldn't lay in on it immediately. But uh, anyway, it's, it's going to be there, and we will find it. And uh, I know there's so much material that's getting it labeled and so on. It's done a tremendous job. They've done a bunch of it's been computerized and so so it's going to be available uh, all over the planet. But uh, the, the clan robe, uh, the one I had was black, but of course when I first joined it was a white rank and file robe. And it cost me, the original white one cost 15 bucks. And it was made by the Betsy Ross chapter of the Ladies Auxiliary. <laughs> and they made, they made their money uh, selling these things for $15. The black robe cost me 65 I guess that's inflation. But uh, I'm sorry I didn't have the robe. It's uh, something that uh, if you don't see it up close and first hand, it, it's difficult to, in spite of the, the television coverage and so on, it's, it's, uh, it's something of an eye opener. Um, After I uh, had the experience of going to the FBI with this matter of the arsenal, and of course we all know this is a daily occurrence with finding that the militias and other racist groups are raiding and uh, cooperating with some of their members inside the armed forces and, and stealing uh, automatic weapons and even tanks. Uh, so, you know, it seems to be an almost uh, weekly uh, news report of, of arsenals being raided. Uh, 
after I had been rebuffed on that, on that occasion, I decided that I was, I mean, it was obvious I couldn't go to the uh, sheriff's office. I couldn't go to the police chief. Uh, and obviously then I couldn't go to the FBI. There was no, no place else to go. So I went to the media. And at that time, Jack Anderson's predecessor was Drew Pearson. Jack Anderson was his office boy at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Drew Pearson had this big call, the Washington Merrick around, and he got a Sunday afternoon coast to coast radio broadcast. And I got with Pearson, and we started broadcasting the minutes of the Klan's last meeting <laughs> every Sunday. And we'd name names. Uh, Brother Judge Luke Arnold was present, and, and all these politicians, and uh, prosecutors, and uh, sheriff's deputies, and uh, by name businessmen, politicians, public servants. Well, the moment we, Pearson did this, uh, things started happening. Uh, the attendance dropped off. These fellows who were being named didn't show up anymore. Uh, it, 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 political people and business people were just disappeared from, from the hall. And a similar effect on recruitment. They had a terrible time of recruiting new members because uh, it was obvious that the plan had been infiltrated. And uh, attendance and recruitment, recruitment dropped off so much that they organized Cyber Number One into the Bumblebees and the Yellow Jackets uh, and <laughs> had a rival teams recruiting members and uh, trying, to, trying to get to make up for what damage we were doing by broadcasting names. And all this was very effective. Uh, <coughs> Pearson came down uh, and spoke from the state capitol steps, and I had to warn him that there was a, a talk inside the Klan of, of picking him off with a high-powered rifle. And so he got a lot of protection, and in fact, they put pressure on Grand Dragon Green to issue his own order to not knock him off. So they said, if they did, they were going to get out to Green and blame him for it. So he, he ordered everybody to leave him alone. So Pearson spoke. Pearson got the medal for, for closing the band, so John Perkins, you know, is still in there, and uh, so I had to stand out in the crowd and, and, and watch Pearson get the medal, which was all right me. Uh, but in addition to the broadcasting the minutes of the Klan's last meeting, um, I went to Superman. Uh, Superman had a radio program. So pretty soon we had a thing going, a series called Superman versus the Grand Dragon. And the AP, I remember, the Associated Press fellow in Atlanta in the Bureau called the Grand Dragon and said, you better look out, that Superman's after you. <laughs> I think I just saw him fly over the house. <laughs> <laughs> and the Grand Dragon said, mess or something, or, and hung up. But anyway, uh, with Superman, I was giving out the password. Uh, things like uh, the sign would be native and the countersign would be born, or the sign would be white and the countersign you'd have to answer was man. And faster, the Grand Dragon would think up these things for each week's meeting. Uh, we, Pearson would have them uh, next coast to coast, and all the kids in the country were running around with bed sheets and playing clams and, and you know, Superman. And knowing all the current passwords, so and it doesn't got to be such a farce that the Grand Dragon, uh, uh, on one occasion, uh, uh, said before the meeting, said, "But I know Superman, uh, no Superman's going to have these. I might just want to go out and call him myself and collect the money." <laughs> 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 that too was very effective. The, the element of ridicule, uh, and especially on the kids' street level. Was, was, I hope, uh, quite effective and, and worth doing. The uh, bottom line on all this was, of course, that the rank and file uh, were beginning to chant at the bit, so to speak. They, uh, I didn't mention that not only was attendance and recruitment knocked in the head, but violence stopped. They were afraid to go on with their floggings and, and castrations and whatever. And uh, 
uh, the rank and file after you know months of this were getting restless. You know, they, they didn't join the plan to sit there and, and talk. And so they were saying, you know, we, we've been lying low long enough. We, we want action. And Grand Dragon would say, uh, you know, just catch the rat, and I'll guarantee you plenty of action. And um, he put out a, an all tavern bulletin offering a thousand dollars a pound for for my uh, posterior, <laughs> FOB Atlanta. And uh, so things were beginning to warm up. Uh, uh, they would have devote entire sessions about, uh, the dragon would say things like, uh, said, knowing the penalty for divulging the clan secrets. I can't imagine how any man would, would have the nerve to, to break that, uh, to do what's being done. He said, when we catch him, I'm going to kneel him in front of the altar there, and I'm going to wear off both arms up to the elbows, working him over. And they opened the floor to suggestions about what they're going to do with me when they caught me. <laughs> All sorts of bright ideas about what to do with me. And on one occasion, uh, he uh, said, opened the meeting by saying, ordering the collector guards to lock all the doors to Clara. And they stood there in front of, in front of the locked door like this. And uh, he said, well, uh, finally, finally caught, caught the rat. The, the bald-headed bastard sitting out right out there tonight. And uh, I, was looking, I was pretty young then, but I was already balding. And I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw there were about seven of us. <laughs> uh, it turned out he was just bluffing. I don't know why he got on the bald-headed. Uh, in any case, he didn't didn't know who he was, but uh, it gave me a real scare. It was as close as close as that came, I guess. But uh, I uh, was very gratified as a result of the infiltration and the, and the uh, you know the, the effects of the media exposure. I was, was tremendous. Nowadays, I, I know that the FBI itself is something I learned rather recently. When an FBI agent uh, in charge of Jacksonville retired, he inadvertently, I think, said to the press, that yes, when, when Congress told us to lay off the students in peace groups, uh, back in the late 60s, I guess, that we stopped, we, you know, just despite them, we stopped infiltrating the Klan to uh, something nobody knows except me, I guess. But anyway, uh, that's when the FBI stopped infiltrating the Klan, Klan, despite Congress telling us to lay off the students. But anyway, uh, someone ought to be in there and, and doing what we did back then. Uh, the damper that all this exposure put on and uh, rough stuff led to the cropping up of more and more front organizations. Uh, the Klan figured, well, it was in Silver they'd start some little sideshow and uh, do their rough stuff uh, through some, <coughs> some front group. And in Atlanta, this took the form of, I was walking down the, the Peachtree Street there on one of the side streets, uh, saw this enormous Confederate battle flag with a superimposed uh, thunderbolt, uh, not the youth thunderbolt that you still see around America today, with the militias and so on. And uh, this group turned out to be the Colombians. They were mostly young fellows. Um, I had worked with Governor Ellis Arnold and we had succeeded in, in revoking the Klan's corporate charter. But the Colombians went into court and ten bucks got themselves a charter. And they were celebrating when I walked in the first time and said, isn't this ridiculous? They said, they're taking away the Klan's charter and he's handing us one with the other hand. They said, we're 40 times worse than the Klan. And uh, they were worse uh, than the Klan. There were a lot of Klansmen in the Colombians. They were brown shirts, uh, Nazi uh, ideologically, or brown shirts and the Nazi Thunderbolt. Uh, worked with Ralph McGill at the Atlanta Constitution, and we got to call him the juvenile delinquents of the Ku Klux Klan. But they were a very dangerous delinquents because they worked with dynamite. And in addition to dynamite, they were, one of the issues of the day was black and white neighborhoods, residential. And so the Colombians, uh, in their uniforms, and Billy Sticks decided they were going to police that there were not going to be any black people walking down the wrong side of the street in these neighborhoods. 
so they would draw a line. And uh, so they did. And I remember one young African-American lad just strolling down the wrong side of the sidewalk uh, listening to some music and at peace with the world and these guys jumped on him and started beating on him. I remember that one of the housewives, uh, one of the Colombians, was up on the porch and asked the lady of the house, said, may I use your flower pot to throw at this fellow? And she said, let your conscience be your guide. And so he threw it, of course. And uh, later in court, when we had this fellow in court, uh, the judge said, what time was it when you were beating on this one here? And the Columbian says, Your Honor, when you're beating on a so-and-so, you don't stop to see what time it is. And I just got a laugh out of everybody, I think including the judge. That's the way it was working back in those days. But uh, so the Colombians, as I say, were dealing in dynamite, and they were talking about uh, blowing up Bridges department store, uh, the largest department store there in Atlanta, and uh, blowing up the Wheat Street uh, Baptist Church because the pastor had said something against the Columbians, and there were many fans of the Columbians. So uh, I was working through Governor Ellis Arnold, who was a very good guy, and he had a prosecutor, a state attorney, a state attorney by the name of uh, Dan Duke. And <coughs> working with Duke, I provided the evidence on the Columbians, and we eventually got them into court, and some of them were gained for better reason had two cards, both the Colombian and the Klan cards. And that thing eventually brought to an end my uh, infiltration because when they called him and Dan Duke got up in front of Fulton Superior Court there in Atlanta and uh, called Seth McKenzie as a witness, all these clans from the place it was Klan practice uh, to pack the court from. Uh, and all these cases involving race racism. And uh, on this occasion it was packed and when they uh, he called Seth and Kennedy and all of them jump up hollering saying it's John Perkins and, you know and uh, one of the clansmen uh, back in the hall pulled a switchblade knife and was going to cut my throat and uh, another clansman an older fellow takes him in hand and says Cut his throat, you know, all right, but not on the fifth floor of the courthouse. <laughs> that's, that's how close that came. I had to call some of my trade union buddies. Uh, I wasn't too sure about the police, so I, I called some. I was working with the labor unions there out of Atlanta in those days, and I called some of them to get me an escort out of that uh, courthouse. But um, we did put some of the Colombians in jail. Um, J.B. Stummer was one uh, one technique I developed uh, while working on the Colombians. I noticed them throwing things in the, their garbage trash baskets all the time, car bombs and so on, and sardine cans and whatnot. So uh, I found a, a, a black man who had a mule and a car, and that this was a while back. They, I said, how about picking up the Colombians' garbage can, you know, and they got like you as a garbage man and go pick up that garbage can and do it whenever it was that they put it out. And I uh, paid him and told him what I was doing. So I uh, suppose for both reasons he, he agreed to do it. It was risky. And uh, out of those garbage cans I obtained all sorts of evidence that we ended up in the courtroom. This was in uh, matter of getting hard, actionable evidence was, of course, the, the basis for the whole, everything I was doing. The preachers were preaching against the Klan, some of them, and newspaper editors, uh, some of them were invading against the Klan, but nobody was collecting evidence that was taken into a court of law. So that uh, <clears throat> this garbage can proved to be very fruitful, including letters from J.B. Stoner. I don't know if the name rings any bells or not, but uh, J.P. was eventually jailed for the dynamiting of a black church and killing some black children, girls, in uh, Alabama. And uh, I first made the acquaintance with J.P. when he was 17 years old. And uh, when I got clean time, I 
So the watch is pretty good, I think they're not. I want to have some question time left too. But back to, to JB, we were sitting on the mountainside outside his shack in Chattanooga. And I said, look, look out, JB, that's poison ivy you're sitting on. He said, poison ivy don't bother me. <laughs> and, uh, he went on to see where he was coming from. He had memorialized Congress to make it illegal to be Jewish in the United States. Uh, capital offense, uh, punishable by death. Everyone pleading guilty of being Jewish to be taken out and executed. Everyone pleading not guilty of given the trial. Um, he uh, said he supported the American war effort because he thought every nation had a right to get rid of its own Jews. He didn't want Hitler doing it for. As for African Americans, he said, I have nothing against them uh, individually, only as a race. He said the only, only solution is repatriation is he called it back to Africa. And with time bombs on board his ship, there's an economy made. And uh, that was JB. Uh, and he was into dynamite and still is. Uh, he's circulating right now in, in Fort Lauderdale uh, parking lot, supermarket. All sorts of literature about all Haitian Americans have AIDS and things like that. So he's a very bad egg and he's still around and he runs for governor of Georgia frequently. It defends Clansman in the courtroom. But uh, this technique of the garbage can is perhaps, uh, I was gratified to learn from a, an anti-fascist group in uh, London uh, throughout the British Isles, really. And they have a same problem over there now. Uh, that taking their cue from my Southern Exposure book where I spoke about this garbage can business. They had adopted the same technique there and were supplying Scotland Yard with profiles of the big, biggest racists in, in the British Isles on the basis of their garbage. So that uh, they were thanking me for uh, giving them this idea. And, uh, I'm going to do some skipping around and because, like I said, I was going to at least some time for your questions. We can go into the aspects of the Klan or into the matter of racism in Florida that, that Bob uh, touched on so well. Um, I do, though, want to say something about the, you know, what's happened since, since the days when I was inside the Klan. Uh, a good many decades have passed, actually. But the Klan is very much out there. And it's even so, and they're bad enough, but uh, in my opinion, when I'm asked, uh, I don't know, feel obliged to say that it's not so much the bed sheet the brigade that threatens human rights in America as it is the plain clothes clux in the halls of government and black clothes clux on the bench. And obviously, Given it to understand very properly that, that you know the end is not yet. That, that uh, where once we had segregated racism, we now have desegregated racism. About, about. And we may no longer be Jim Crow, but we're just about as black ghettos as we ever were. And in addition to the Ku Klux Klan, we've got the militia and the great many clans on inside the militia. And right here in the state of Florida, the Grand Dragons of the state, a fellow named John Baumgartner, who's now living up at McIntosh near Gainesville, uh, gets out a newsletter for clans on the militiamen. And right after the Oklahoma bombing, for example, Baumgartner was writing and publishing and sending to the U.S. mail. And they have a uh, network, a website, uh, gloating about how the walls came tumbling down. And he said the sheeple inside got what was coming to them. And uh, he's making a play on not people, but sheeple, because they were working for the federal government in the wrong place and so forth. So we've got that type of uh, mentality very much in evidence, and uh, with the militia taking uh, 
in large part the, the role which the Klan was so long played in society. And the racists moving into the militias to fill the vacuum police field. But they don't have any idea of their own advanced uh, full idea. And uh, Baumgartner, uh, these people don't mind telling you what they intend to do. It's very much like Hitler. He didn't pull any, uh, make any bones about what he intended to do. And in the case of the militias, they, their published agendas on the website calling for the overthrow of not only of the United States government, but of what they call ZOG, Z-O-G, Zionist Occupational uh, Government, behind the American government, whatever that's all about. And beyond that, they're going to abolish the United Nations. And beyond that, they're going to have a global holocaust <coughs> that around. They're not going to just do it in Germany or Europe or going to be global. And as for all other peoples, uh, they're still talking to, uh, back to Africa. Uh, and for those who don't want to go back to Africa, uh, they're talking about uh, non-citizenship, not second-class citizenship, the way, I, the way I wrote about the Jim Crow system, uh, where you had uh, Hispanics and African-Americans and in many cases Jewish-Americans and other minorities, Native Americans, and not to mention women, uh, all uh, in the uh, same boat of the second class citizenship. Well, the militias are not thinking of second class citizenship, they think of non citizenship this time around. That it would be a white republic when the militias take it over. And all of their mud people, they're calling them, will be non citizens and tolerated to death. And very definitely segregated. So the militias, in my opinion, are certainly uh, worth worrying about. I like that before closing, I want to say a word uh, to about uh, what you read in the papers about the cross burnings and the wearing of the mask. Uh, Bob and I, uh, down through the years, fought for the uh, state and municipal law outlawing the use of burning of crosses on uh, public property at least, and the wearing of masks, the clan masks. And this, this thing is still going on. Uh, there was challenged in the Florida legislature not a couple of years ago. Uh, trying to reach to revoke the ban on the mask. And uh, the thought I would like to uh, submit to you is that the mask of the Klan is every much, bit as much prima facie evidence of criminal intent as the bank robber's mask. So when the ba bank robber walks into the bank with a, with a mask on his face, the guard doesn't, uh, uh, you know, he, he pulls his gun. In my opinion, the mask of the Klan is just as much an evidence of criminal intent that uh, uh, every Klan meeting, as a matter of fact, is, is, as far as I'm concerned, is a criminal conspiracy and ought to be prosecuted as a criminal conspiracy. Because they're, uh, unlike the bank robber who just wants your money, uh, these fellows are out for your rights as human beings. They're far more precious uh, loot. And, uh, the same, much the same thing I think can be said about the burning of crosses. So uh, uh, even the American Civil Liberties Union, I'm sure, was the best of intentions, uh, saying that this uh, should be looked upon as free speech. But I don't see the burning cross as free speech. I see it as an act of terrorism. And I think that's the only view possible in the light of the uh, record. You have a historical record and you've got a criminal record, and all of attesting to the fact that the fire cross has a very specific purpose, and that is to intimidate American citizens out of practicing some right which they're entitled to. And uh, I don't call that free speech. I call that intimidation and conspiracy. And uh, we need to think in terms of ways and means of having public officials uh, who will see things in some such light. And, I don't see any real solution to things like 
the Klan and the militias uh, outside of the enactment of laws and the enforcement of those laws. You're going to have to have law and order. We talk about ethnic cleansing all around the world. And uh, uh, I don't think anything can stop it uh, except law and enforcing the law. It's a, you're not allowed to do it. You're disturbing the peace. And just like any other disturbance of the peace, it's criminal. And if you do it, you're going to lock you up. And proceed to lock them up. Oh, uh, one final word on that because you know, we, you know we, we all like to talk about the, uh, equal uh, equality in the abstract. And uh, I, I'm obliged to say that, in my opinion, we can't really have any kind of equality. That the stuff is indivisible. <clears throat> that we cannot have any one kind of it without having the whole hog. That uh, you cannot build, for example, cultural equity on a foundation of economic and social and political inequity. Which means, uh, again, I think that we're standing in the need of perestroika or restructuring just as much as the Russians ever were. That we're going to have to have that kind of society in which there really is equal opportunity out there. And on that subject, I want to close this. When David Duke, and I think much of our trouble with the militias, for example, they didn't just come up like mushrooms. They came up because people like David Duke and, as I may say, so George Bush from the White House and countless other public figures talking about uh, preferential treatment and quota systems and so on. And uh, so I, I'm going to close by just saying that if the likes of David Duke and, and others who are speaking that same language, They're, first of all, and may create a fireball in mainstream politics. And if they really think women and minorities are getting preferential treatment, they ought to uh, get themselves a sex change and think themselves alive and, and check it out. I thank you all. <laughs>
so it's, it's like that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your remarks. Mm -hmm. As one of you said, it's the, the South during the time and still studying. If you look at the Southern Regional Council and the Southern Conference Educational Fund, the Highlander Folk School, and the WACC, many of these organizations work primarily to persuade people and to use reason and to use their best, uh, uh, shall we say, religious morals and so forth to correct their behavior. Others of them, the Southern Conference of Human Welfare, they worked uh, more, uh, shall we say, uh, militantly. They were more involved in uh, uh, direct action. As you have worked with these people over the years, do you think that there was uh, a role for this more direct action uh, like the Southern Conference for Human Welfare and Southern Conference for Educational Fund and mm. Southern Regional Council and the Mrs. Mm. Jesse Daniel Ames and mm. Dorothy Tilly trying to prevent lynching, working to educate people about the evils of the mm. land? So this is the you know, basic question that covers the waterfront and it goes back to what Bob said in, in his opening remarks that, that nobody's giving you anything mm. and uh, you're going to have to uh, uh, hit the floor and, and haul off to get any attention. And I, I think that's very definitely true that uh, the African American liberation that took place in this country and is relative and not done yet. But uh, it happened uh, not because anybody was in the mood to give anybody anything, but because African Americans hit the street and confronted the, the white bosses and the establishment and took them up and said, you know, this is not going to continue. And it would not have changed had they not done it. Not then. And I, I do think it was fortunate and the right thing, needless to say, uh, that there were some white Americans uh, right in there with them, uh, waiting to get by. But I think that's true. We've seen around the world that it's uh, people power is being called, uh, uh, hitting the streets uh, when, when it's necessary. There are other means, of course, but that's certainly the last resort. When, when all else fails, uh, there's nothing else you can do but to, to make yourself heard. So I'm all for people power, sticking roses in the barrels of cannons, things like that, the way they did in Beijing and Bucharest and all the various other capitals of the world in the Philippines. And uh, even back to the time you're talking about in the 40s, uh, I was involved in that uh, argument back then, you know, when uh, many people were going around saying, well, uh, prejudice is a matter of the heart. You can't legislate on the subject of prejudice. You've got to educate it out of the individual. And uh, my observation then and now was that people who were saying that they didn't really want any change. Uh, we've, we've had preachers preaching at us for 2,000 years, for example, and we still kill each other without you know, the same religion. It doesn't really make that much difference. Protestant, Catholic, yeah, Muslim. So the preaching, we may have been much worse. I'm not discounting preaching uh, because we may have been a lot worse than we are without it. But in any case, it hasn't put a stop to racism and it hasn't put a stop to war. And um, so I'm for all the preaching and, and the direct action, you know, whatever it takes to, to get the message across. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I would just uh, like to compliment you and Bob Sons. I just can't imagine the courage that it, that it took to do what you fellows did back during that period of time. Um, people ask me, not scared, I'm scared all the time. <laughs> <laughs> still, still am. <laughs> I couldn't imagine myself even trying to do something like that without a, a hundred other people, all of us well armed. Uh, which leads to my point. Um, it, it seems that all during this time, uh, it, my belief is that people who joined the Klan or these militia, militia groups and the Nazis themselves were basically cowards. And it seems to me that any time that they were confronted, by uh, violence aimed at them, they backed off. In many instances during the 50s and 60s when groups like the Deacons for Defense and Justice in Louisiana uh, went up against some of these races and they ran away. In North Carolina, uh, African Americans and American Indians yep. uh, mm -hmm. armed themselves and they immediately turned and ran. Uh, do you think that there is a need for that kind of activity against some of these, clans, these uh, militia groups? Well, let me make the point uh, while there's still time. I'm glad you brought up these questions because uh, I just want everyone to imagine what would happen if 
African Americans or Hispanic Americans or Jewish Americans were out in the woods wearing uh, khaki uniforms and, and training with machine guns and automatic weapons. Uh, you can just imagine how long a black uh, militia would last yeah. before being put behind bars in concentration camps. And uh, back in, in one of my books, uh, After Appomattox, out there on the table, I, this question was put during the Reconstruction Plan of Terror. And the black preacher said, I'm counseling my people not to take up arms in self-defense because if we do, they will exterminate us in the same way that they're exterminating the American Indians. And we're going to have to find other, other, uh, other ways to go. And of course, in a century later, Martin Luther King said, we'll do it by civil disobedience and passive resistance and pray in. And uh, that got results. But uh, the presence of, of black pastors and black children, I think that no one's given the children enough credit. Uh, what happened in the 60s was a, a crusade, a children's crusade. And the, the kids got out in the street and the old folks were shamed and they got out there with them. I, I saw it and I was there. And uh, those that's the fact. Uh, that's about all I would say. You, you know, uh, the American Revolution was the same question. You know, do we fight or uh, how do we do it? And, Sometimes it's necessary. I would, uh, you touched on a point there that I think is a little scary. You have, you have no think black groups. I uh, think of Reverend Farrakhan for one. Maybe Mr. Saunders can speak on that. Uh, might they make the same mistake that the clients are making by becoming too militant and scare, perhaps, or frighten, you know, the so-called white supporters that they do have in this country? I find that I'm on the, I'm on the fence there. It's can black militantism work against themselves? I don't know. Uh, black militancy is, of course, you start looking for a motivation and reasons, historical uh, reasons for a, a black stealing militancy. If I were black, I'd, I'd be pretty damn militant. Right. Uh, you know, uh, an awful lot been done to, to me and my people uh, over the generations. So, uh, as the French would say, you know, maybe they've got reasons. Uh, so uh, the, the whole question of, uh, I, I'm not at all inclined to, to justify racism, if you call it that, that in part of any minority against any other minority. You know, but this thing is a phenomenon that's not, not just American, and uh, it's uh, global. And if the other person talks and walks and, and, and uh, dances and uh, eats and dresses different than, than I do, then, you know, you've got to die. And uh, even if you do everything pretty much the same, you get Protestants and Catholics, uh, cousins killing each other. Uh, you don't, don't worship God in the right way. So it's, it's a global, global problem. And I don't know how to, the Caesars, you know, were told that, so-called barbarians that we don't want you fighting each other, we want you working for us, so cut out the rough stuff and get to work. And uh, to my mind, uh, when you've got thousands of years of bloodletting or persecution or even several centuries as we have in this country, it's just going to have to be a matter of law that nobody's going to uh, ride on the backs of anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be a matter of law and of course, no matter who comes up, it's going to ride on somebody else's back. Yes. Um, there was a YMCA college in Chicago whose faculty and uh, president retired to form Roosevelt College and later Roosevelt University. Their thing was, for one thing, their, the Y College had sorority so that you, uh, if you were one, you were not accepted. If you were another religion, you were accepted there. The blacks were not accepted. So the whole program then changed uh, in that university. Uh, there are quiet ways for fighting uh, bigotry. And uh, uh, I'm also wondering about, oh, I, I've been, I attended one church during uh, World War II where the minister was, although we were fighting against what was happening in Germany, the minister uh, spoke against the Jews. 
the um, now there's a uh, church that was excluded from Germany that is trying to that's trying here in this country. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember that. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so how can you I mean fighting Scientology is like fighting the book of it is very much so. I understand you. I was fighting for some people last five mm -hmm. years. And I was going to ask you, what are your suggestions for strategies? Because I was reading in the plan on that, some of the strategies that you have when the Department of Justice and the state attorney general's office and the local police are infiltrated, what are some strategies for getting around that and getting the job done as far as dealing with a racist organization such as the Church of Scientology and the issues of the Pioneer Company? I've spent about eight years overseas on uh, four continents, uh, living the life in uh, dozens and dozens of different countries and different uh, religions and uh, different political systems, and some uh, somewhat democratic and some uh, more than somewhat dictatorial. And I couldn't help but notice that this thing we're talking about is, is global, you know, it's the same, got the same earmarks wherever you find it. And, uh, I think we're going to have to work at it not only in our own backyard, but think globally as well. And I can't at my age, you know, uh, uh, if I were to talk to a uh, you know, freshman class, I'd say that, that's your problem. I've, I've done what I could. And <laughs> 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 I've given you all, all, all the answers I can, but uh, uh, it, I wouldn't talk to the 20th century for the, uh, the, talk the 21st. You know, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, the 20th was probably the bloodiest of all centuries, no question about it, but I, I would, I, I'm afraid the 21st could be even worse because of what you're just talking about. And I, the only bottom line I can come up with is, uh, is going to have to make a matter of law that you can't do these things, uh, you can't advocate them even, because the advocacy is a conspiracy and, and uh, an incitement to riot, and uh, it's going to have to be enforced. I don't think we have to have a Caesar or a Hitler or a Stalin or anybody to, to uh, things get very quiet if you've got a dictatorship of any kind. But there must have got to be a way for a democracy to, to stop people from disturbing the peace. And uh, it, it, racism is a form of domestic uh, warfare and, and we just have to find some formula for it. And it gets back to that uh, bottom, bottom line that I said a while ago got to be uh, that equity is indivisible. We can't have the peace that's in peace. We're going to have to have a society that is uh, just and nobody's riding on anybody else's side. And I, I've been concluding sometimes by saying, you know, that we're going to have to share our America or lose it. And uh, that, that's part of it. Yeah. I think you used the phrase a while ago, uh, spoke, speaks to the root cause for me when you spoke of preferential treatment and it's been my observation that all of us whenever we get a chance we take advantage of gaining preferential treatment do you have any ideas of how we can get at that but i'm fully in favor of laws and enforcing them but i think that that is only a surface activity and until we can get at how we can avoid each of us seeking preferential treatment that we will mm -hmm. it's you know i've, I've been uh, i dabble in, in uh, biology and, and nature and try to figure out what mother nature is trying to tell us and we always think we know better than mother nature about everything and uh <coughs> Part of it, if, if uh, any living organism, a microscopic or whatever, if it's not egocentric to a degree, it's not going to live long. It's got to be egocentric about many things. And, and, uh, but what happens is we take a natural thing like territoriality, where, whereby other creatures establish a place to live and, and eat and breed. Apparently, um, we turn territoriality into an empire, one continent going to conquer and, and rules and all that, so that we, we take the, the cues that Mother Nature gives us and distort them into things from territoriality to, to empire. And the same is true in the question of race or any group, uh, whether in terms of class or race or religion. 
can put down another group on the basis of drawing group lines, you've got uh, still another problem. It's not, not just a question of individual competition. You've got something much more, more insidious. And uh, there has to be rules of the game, and, and rules have to be enforced. Uh, on this, if you're talking about affirmative action, uh, whether that's preferential or not, uh, you know, for generations, uh, the quota for blacks was zero. And what we're talking about is that women and minorities have been playing and forced to play with loaded dice. And those dice are still loaded. And there's no way to pick game square except to fix those dice. And I think, yeah. I want to stop on that note because I've got a pitch plan. <laughs> <laughs>